Okay, so I will, I'm going to say one more thing about um, how to think about the Buddha before I actually go through these particular points that I mentioned here. Uh, and this is uh, another way of uh, uh, kind of bringing you closer to the Buddha, if you like. Uh, and uh, this idea is the idea of imagining yourself actually meeting the Buddha. Yeah, imagining meeting the Buddha. Are you ready for that? Yeah, you sure? Okay. <laughs> well, you're very brave. Okay, this is very brave because uh, meeting the Buddha is kind of, you know, for many people, it's a bit sort of scary. Yeah, it's a bit, you know, what, what is it going to be like to meet the Buddha? But uh, it can make the Buddha seem more natural and seem more approachable if you have some idea what it might mean to meet the Buddha. So one way of doing this is to imagine that the Buddha, you are kind of uh, the Buddha, maybe the Buddha is here in Malaysia, maybe you are visiting India, or maybe you are there two and a half thousand years ago when the Buddha was around. Uh, and uh, very often the Buddha would be in the forest. Uh, yeah? You see this in the suttas in many places. Uh, the Buddha is sitting at the root of a tree somewhere, at the foot of a tree, uh, and he's t in the Maha Karuna meditation, the great compassion meditation or something like that. Uh. And then you hear from someone, someone tells you, oh, the Buddha is in the forest over there. And you think, really? The Buddha? Are you sure you're saying the Buddha? This is, a, this is, a, this is another nice story from the suttas. Uh, yeah, I, I told this recently, maybe that was in Sri, Sri Lanka, I can't remember where it was. Uh, and this is the story of Anattapindika. Uh, Anattapindika, the great kind of lay disciple of the Buddha who uh, builds up the monastery, the Anattapindika's monastery and all of that. Uh, this is the story of how Anattapindika got to meet the Buddha, yeah, the first meeting of the two. Huh? And uh, this is where Anattapindika he goes to, he is from Savati, the great capital of Kosala, but he has a brother-in-law in Rajagaha, which is kind of far away, hundreds of kilometers away. And then he travels to Rajagaha to, on business, yeah, to meet his brother-in-law. And then when it comes to his brother-in-law's house, the brother-in-law is a very wealthy businessman, has this really big house, and when it comes to his house, the brother-in-law doesn't look after him. Yeah, usually you look after your brother-in-law who doesn't care about him. Instead, he's running around doing business, telling his servants, do this, do that, you know, get this ready, get that ready. Yeah. And then in the evening time, finally, he takes a breath and he goes to the brother-in-law, goes to Anatapindika, and finally they sit down and they have a chat. And Anatapindika says to his brother-in-law, says, what's going on? Usually when I come to your house, you kind of, you know, you look after me, you say hello, but now you're just running around doing all this stuff, yeah. What's happening? Are you, have you invited King Bimbisara with a fourfold army to your house? Have you, are you going to have some kind of great wedding ceremony? What is happening? Yeah, well, how come you're so busy? And then, uh, Bim, uh, then the brother-in-law says, no, I haven't invited the king or anything like that. I have not going to have a big wedding ceremony or anything like that. No, I have invited the Buddha for the meal tomorrow. Antipindika says, did you say Buddha? He says, I said Buddha. Did you say Buddha? <laughs> I said Buddha. And the third time, did you say Buddha? Say Buddha. And then Antipindika says, wow, the word Buddha is rare to hear in the world. Yeah, he's never heard the word Buddha uh, before in the, maybe the present life or whatever. It's really rare to, can I go and see that Buddha? It's the first thing he says, where is that Buddha now? Can I go and see him? And uh, his brother knows as well, he's staying in this uh, place yeah, outside of the town or whatever. Now is not a good time to see the Buddha. Yeah, this is the wrong time to see the Buddha. And, but tomorrow morning is a good time. Huh? And then uh, Antapindika eventually goes to sleep. Yeah? And in the nighttime, he gets up three times. He's so excited about going to see the Buddha in the morning. He can't sleep properly, right? Gets up, he's thinking, oh, okay, sleep a bit more. Get up again, sleeping a bit more. And he goes on like this for many times. Uh, and eventually, he can't stop himself anymore. It's still dark, but dawn is getting very close. Uh, and so he gets out of bed, yeah, and he, it's really dark outside. Uh, and you can imagine in those days, he goes to the city gate. Uh, and after the city gate, everything is just black. Yeah, there's no lights, nothing. And he becomes really fearful. Uh, I don't know, what, 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 do you, what do you feel like walking around in the darkness in India? Couldn't see anything. Would you like that? Or would you become a little bit fearful maybe? Yeah, <laughs> All the bandits around, all these kind of dodgy things. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, It's natural to be a bit fearful. So he almost turns back. Yeah? But then the power of the faith kind of drives him onward. Yeah? And then he walks. Eventually, he arrives at the monastery. He arrives at where the Buddha is staying yeah? And the Buddha is just walking back and forth. He's doing Chankama. Chankama is walking back and forth. Uh, and then he sees uh, Anantapindika coming. Uh, and then he says to Anantapindika, Come, Sudatta, 
So that time, Antapendika's Antapendika given name. And so then, of course, he, Antapendika is amazed. How come he knows my name? Yeah, I've never met him before. And then they sit down. And then uh, Antapendika says to the Buddha, what do you think he says to the Buddha? What is a natural thing to say when you meet the Buddha the first time? What would you say if you met the Buddha in the forest? <laughs> How are you? <laughs> yeah, that is basically what he's saying. He said, to the Buddha, because it's early morning, he said to the Buddha, have you slept well? That's what he says to the Buddha. Yeah? And then uh, the Buddha says the, something about you know, the one who is fully awake and with no defilements always sleeps well or something like that. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and then Antapindaka is just completely, you know, he becomes a stream enter and all of these kind of things, and he's completely converted and becomes kind of a real Buddhist. And then, of course, then he leaves the monastery and then he establishes the Jeta Grove and all these kind of things afterwards. That is an, a kind of an example of a meeting of the Buddha, yeah? So you kind of, did you say Buddha? Buddha, did you say Buddha? <laughs> Buddha. Then he goes off into the forest on, on, that, on that basis. And so this is like you, yeah? You can imagine someone tells you there is a Buddha in the forest. And you say, what? Did you say Buddha? <laughs> and then you get really excited, yeah? Because this is an opportunity to see this great spiritual master. Yeah? And so you start walking into the forest. Yeah? And when you walk into the forest to meet the Buddha, yeah? you're a bit like Antapindika. You feel a bit of, kind of, you feel a bit fearful, yeah? What, what this Buddha, he has this enormous reputation. Yeah? Will he read my mind? Yeah, what will he do when I get there? If I have this, you know, you know what it's like. If if someone can read your mind, yeah, all the bad thoughts come because you know you're not supposed to think those bad thoughts, yeah. So don't think of the white elephant. Don't think of the white of the of the bad thoughts. And of course, because you don't want to think them, that's where they come out, right? <laughs> so we come to the Buddha. All these bad thoughts come out, yeah, because not because you want to think them, because they they kind of they inflict themselves on you or whatever. Yeah. But uh, anyway, as you, then you walk into the forest, a little bit apprehensive, a little bit uncertain about what's going to happen. Uh, and then you, as you go into the forest, uh, you see this person uh, at the foot of a tree. Uh, and what is this person like? Well, the person looks like a monk, yeah? Because the Buddha, it says in the sutta, as he puts on the monk's robe, it's not quite like this, but, uh, you know, monk's robe, he has a shaven head. Uh, so basically you see a monk at the foot of a tree here. Uh, but then as you approach this monk, the Buddha, you realize that there is an aura about this person. Uh, something about this person that isn't quite like everyone else. Uh, there's a sense of peace about this person. Uh, you kind of enter this field of peace uh, and also a field of benevolence. Uh, yeah, there's a peaceful and kind feeling about this whole area. And because you feel that, uh, you start to calm down a little bit. Uh, you're no longer so fearful. Uh, and then as you approach the Buddha, this feeling of peace, this feeling of some kind of powerful presence becomes even more tangible. Yeah, It's like entering a, a sacred space when you are with something that is very powerful like this. And so you walk all the way up to the Buddha. And when you walk all the way up to the Buddha, you start to feel more relaxed because now you are in the presence of this person. You don't feel anymore there's anything to fear from this person at all. And then the Buddha looks at you, yeah. <laughs> Buddha says, sit down. <laughs> Not to stand there, sit down, yeah. Buddha is always compassionate. Eh? And then you sit down, and then the Buddha says to you, what does the Buddha say to you? Eh? Buddha says, have you come from afar? Eh? Yeah. Have you had enough to eat? Are you, are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> How are you? Are you okay? And you say, yeah, oh, I just came from the local village over here. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm okay. I've had enough to eat or whatever. And then so the Buddha says, well, have you got something to ask? Yeah. And then <laughs> you don't really know what to say. Yeah, you're in the presence of the Buddha. So you say, oh, yeah, I had this argument with my wife or husband. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and you may think, yeah, the Buddha has more important things to do than talk about your wife and husband and what has been happening in your life. Uh, but the Buddha has compassion. He understands what it's like yeah, to be wife and husband. He has also, actually, at one point before, yeah, had a, had a wife. So he understands that situation. Yeah. And so he gives you some advice. Uh, yeah, the Buddha says to you something very simple. Oh, remember to have compassion. Remember everyone in the world has suffering. Yeah. They're probably just going through a hard time. Yeah, try to understand the other side of the, uh, you know, of, of the person, what is going on with them. Uh, yeah, and when you have more compassion, when you try to understand it, uh, Everything will be fine. 
And so you listen to the Buddha. Huh? And the Buddha doesn't say anything profound. Huh? The Buddha doesn't tell you about dependent origination. The Buddha doesn't say anything about the ending of all existence, anything like that. The Buddha gives you some very, very simple advice. But it is about where that advice is coming from that is so powerful. Yeah? It is not the advice itself, the words themselves you may already have known. But it's the fact that it comes from a place that is kind of imbued with benevolence, with kindness, with compassion. That is what is so powerful about this. So even though you hear something that is not really extraordinary, it still it goes deep inside of you in a way that you never would have expected. Because these personal qualities of the Buddha are so powerful. You feel that you are in the presence of something different, something extraordinary. You have seen something that you don't normally see in the world. And then, because of this feeling, you say, oh, thank you, Venerable Sir. And now you really want to bow down. You want to bow down because you understand this is really worthy of bowing down to. There's no sense of ego there. It is not that you are bowing down to someone who wants you to be the disciple, someone who wants to kind of take advantage of you or anything like that. No, you're bowing down to these beautiful qualities. You understand that there's something very worthy of being bowed down to. And of course, the amazing thing is that when we bow down to the Buddha, for example, yeah, in this way, when we bow down to those qualities, we are also building up the same qualities within us. Because by respecting those qualities, we're also making those qualities stronger within ourselves. So you just really want to bow down. This is kind of the feeling of being in the presence of the Buddha. It's like, wow, this is special. You bow down. Maybe you have some tears in your eyes because you understand that this is really special. There's something very unique about this. If you bow down to something that has a powerful emotional impact like that, you can expect maybe to feel a few tears. It is natural. You bow down to the Buddha, then you get up and you walk away. And when you walk away, you know that this incident, this time, this presence with the Buddha, is something that you will never forget, even though it was so simple. And so then you walk back and you carry those words in your heart. Be compassionate. Understand that other people are suffering. Try to understand their point of view. And you bring this into your life. And you never forget it. And this is how you become a very powerfully virtuous and kind person. Because these words are penetrated into you in a way that words almost never penetrate into another person. It's like you have gotten the right view. You cannot forget this thing anymore. That right view is more powerful than your mindfulness. And it take it with you into your life. And then... Because of the power of these things, because you can never forget this, because it like, is like a positive trauma in your life. Yeah, you go back eventually to the Buddha again. You ask for more teachings, and then gradually the path develops from there. So this is a way of thinking about the Buddha. This is a way of making it real. Yeah, understanding that the Buddha, what is the Buddha? The Buddha is just these wonderful qualities. The Buddha has been transformed psychology. Yes, he is an ordinary human being, but he has transformed the ordinary human being into something very pure, something beautiful. The sense of self is gone, and all that remains are these beautiful qualities, wisdom, compassion, kindness, patience, all these things that we all really are aspiring for on this path. So... Um, that is another way of developing the Buddha Nusati, yeah? And, and a way, so every time, in a sense, when we bow down to the Buddha, that is a time of Buddha Nusati. Yeah? That is a time of recollecting the Buddha. If you bow down in the right way, you have this kind of attitude when you do it. Yeah? Then it becomes very powerful. Yeah? Then it becomes, has meaning. Yeah? Very often in Buddhism, like all other religions, we do too many things in a ritualistic kind of way. And rituals are okay, but we want to add something more to it. And if we can add real meaning to the rituals, they become far more powerful as a consequence. So see if you can build up some of these things inside of you when you bow down to the Buddha. And then bowing becomes very, very powerful. It becomes a reminder of the Dhamma. It becomes an opportunity to build up those qualities within yourself as you're bowing down to the Buddha. And you can see how this really makes the whole path progress as a consequence. All right.
So um, that is a little bit about the uh, recollection of the Buddha. I, what I will do now is to actually go through uh, the things in the Sutta itself uh, fairly quickly because I've said most of the things I want to say, but let's have a very quick look at those things too. All right. So a noble disciple recollects the Buddha, yeah, that realized one, the Tathagata. The word Tathagata means something like the one who has arrived at truth or the one who has thus gone or something like that. Tata is can be truth or it can be thus, and Gatta or Agata can mean arrive or gone. So arrive thus or gone to truth or something like that. And so this is how you do it. The Blessed One is perfected. Yeah, so perfected here is uh, Arahant. Yeah, this is the idea perfected. And uh, the meaning of Arahant is actually the worthy one. That's what it really means. Uh, Arahati, you are worthy. What are you worthy of? Well, you are worthy of uh, other people's support and kindness because you are giving away the highest kind of gift in the world. And then you are also the worthy of recipient of the gifts of others, yeah, hospitality and kindness and generosity and all kind of these, these kind of things. So, so this is what it really means, the worthy one. But the Buddha is worthy because he is perfected. And so the extended meaning of Arahant is the idea that you are perfected. Yeah? So this is a nice translation of the idea of the blessed one there. Yeah, so perfected is a... a I think a good translation. Right? It was a general usage, a general term at the time in India, not just used by the Buddhists, but also used by the rest of society, meaning someone who had kind of uh, perfected the human condition, if you like. Yeah. So this is the uh, lesser one, is an arahant. A fully awakened Buddha, samma sambuddha. And uh, so this has the idea of awakening in it. Uh, kind of coming out of the dream, drawing back the veil from the world, seeing things clearly, coming out of delusion, the idea of awakening. And uh, Samma, Sambuddha, uh, this is the, uh, uh, in contrast to the Pacheka Buddhas. Yeah, the Pacheka Buddhas are the private Buddhas or solitary Buddhas, uh, whereas the fully awakened Buddha becomes the teacher for the world. Uh, so you are fully awakened and then you teach the world uh, as a consequence of that, uh, because of that compassion that you have. Uh, Fully awakened Buddha, accomplished in knowledge and con conduct, vijja charana sampanno. Yeah, so accomplished in knowledge means accomplished in insight. You have the highest kind of insight. And here again, the idea of vijja. Vijja is not just knowledge, it is insight into uh, the profoundest part of existence. And often this means a rebirth, and it means the understanding of the kamma, which is the driver of rebirth, and then finally the insight into the Four Noble Truths, which is the uh, awakening insight. Yeah? These are the three main insights when we talk about vijja, uh, talk about understanding the world. Uh, and uh, what is, of course, interesting, and this is kind of the point, and this is what I was trying to do with my kind of Buddha reflection just now, is that when you have that kind of insight, it changes you as a person. And so your conduct is different as a consequence of that insight. It is not just an understanding which has no impact. It has a fundamental impact on your behavior and how you deal with the world around you. Your defilements are gone and all that remains are good qualities. And that is good news because what that means is that it is possible to some extent to know whether someone has deep insight or not because they will be different. They will no longer act like an ordinary human being. Yeah, they, um, you, they should never be angry, for example. They should not be greedy. They should not have 25 Rolls Royces. Uh, yeah? And uh, they are not so detached that they are detached even to detachment. That's not, <laughs> that's not how it works. Uh, yeah? so, they, so they live simple lives. In the suttas, it says that if an arahant, uh, you can no longer store up goods uh, like you did as a layperson. Uh, because storing up of goods is like looking to the future, to somehow secure the future. Arahants don't think like that. They don't secure things. They don't store things up. They just kind of, life just takes its course in a sense. And so that's why Arahants are no longer householders. Yeah, they don't, don't live in the ordinary household life. And they 
tend to become monks straight away. If you, if you know, lay person you happen to become an arahant, you probably become a monk pretty much straight away here uh, as a consequence. Uh. And so your conduct is changed. That is how you can, this is the good thing. Yeah, you can tell whether someone is an arahant. So if someone behaves badly, they're not an arahant. End of story. You don't have to kind of worry, wonder too much about that. Uh. And uh, so this is kind of empowering because it means that when you, uh, you don't have to just go with the crowd. If the crowd says this monk is an arahant, yeah, and they, the reason they abuse people is just because that's what arahants do sometimes. Uh, don't believe it. Yeah? Arahants don't abuse people. End of story. Arahants are kind. They are compassionate. They are understanding. Yeah? And so don't be afraid of making your own judgment about things. Not really hard judgment. Not too fast. Be humble about the limits of your own understanding. Yeah? But also don't be afraid of at least making a, a preliminary judgment. Yeah, this doesn't look right to me. Okay, so then probably isn't right. But don't make it. Sometimes we can't get things wrong. Yeah? But it, that's a useful kind of rule of thumb, not to be afraid of your own judgment. And so, yeah, people are supposed to be different if they have that kind of insight. Accomplished in conduct and insight. This is the Buddha. Holy. So this is uh, the, the Pali word here is Sugato. And uh, Sugato means, Gato again means like gone, basically. It is really a a prefix that a suffix that doesn't have a very specific meaning often and su again is good yeah like before su and du and su is good du is bad so this is like well gone is often the way this trans is uh, translated and that is a very literal translation uh, and maybe not so good uh, but uh, the idea is for example if you are reborn in a good destination you're called sugati sugati is similar to this and in other words so it has this idea of gone to a good destination. In other words, you are happy, yeah? So happy might be a good translation for Sugato, happy one, or supremely happy one or something like that. That is, uh, I think, allowable. The one who has gone to a good place or arrived at a good destination. Holy, holy is a, is a more kind of impressionistic or art, artifarty uh, <laughs> kind of uh, translation, yeah? But it's more, it's not literal, but it's kind of a feeling for what the word means. Uh. But, so the Buddha is someone who has arrived at a good destination, yeah? Sugato. Huh? Knower of the world. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is loka vidu. Loka being the world, being in, like the universe. Uh, and knower vidu, it's related to vidya, so very similar to the word we had before. Huh? And so what does it mean to know the world? Well, it means that... Uh, of course, it means knowing the kind of various realms and all of these kind of things. And uh, the reason why that matters, why you should know the various realms, is because then you know what is the possibilities yeah, in the world. Uh, what are the potential rebirths that you can have? Uh, and what are the bad rebirths that you can have? All of these kind of things. Uh, yeah? The more you know, you need to know the world fully to be able to understand what is the potential for happiness and suffering and all of these kind of things. So the Buddha has a complete picture of happiness and suffering. This is really what this means. And only when you have a complete picture of happiness and suffering, including all the various destinations, only then can you make a decision about whether you should leave it all behind or not. Yeah, we need to have a full understanding. Also, you need to know whether those destinations are permanent or not. How long do you stay there? Are they just supported by conditions so you might get reborn somewhere else later on? So Loka Vidu has this kind of broad expanse of knowing, having the complete picture of the universe, of rebirths, of kamma, all of these things that leads to the various destinations. And once you know that, then you know enough to decide what uh, you should be doing, whether you should leave it all behind or not. Uh, yeah? So uh, this is an important part of the Buddha's understanding and knowledge. Uh, He is the supreme guide for those who wish to train. Yeah, this is the Anuttara Purisadhamma Sarati. Yeah, so uh, these are the tame for those who wish to, to train or for those who are tameable. I think it's more literal translation in the particular in this particular case. So for those who are tameable. That means that you are listening to the word of the Buddha. That makes you tameable. If you're not interested in the word of the Buddha, you're not tameable. You are wild. And don't, don't be wild. Yeah? Be tameable. Yeah? Otherwise, you have a problem. Yeah? And so you are within the ballpark of tameability. Yeah? 
And then uh, if that is the case, well, then the Buddha is your supreme guide. Why? Because he has the full insight into the nature of uh, uh, what it means to be human again. Yeah? Supreme guide for those who wish to be trained. No vested interest, uh, no desires apart from helping out everyone in the world uh, to the best of his ability. And those abilities are pretty high be precisely because he's a Buddha. Highest kind of ability in helping people out combined with compassion. That's pretty, uh, pretty awesome, as they say. Teacher of gods and humans. Uh, yeah, the uh, idea that you, you see this in the suttas when the Buddha teaches the gods. Yeah, you have a very famous sutta, the Sakapanya Sutta, which I really love. It's a very beautiful sutta. Sakka Devinda. Devinda means the Lord of the gods. He comes down to the Buddha and asks the Buddha for advice. Yeah, and there's this beautiful kind of a, a back and forth between the Buddha, answering question between the Buddha and Sakka. Yeah, and at the end of this whole thing, Sakka becomes a stream enter. Yeah. The Lord of the Gods is a stream mentor. Isn't that cool? Is that nice? Yeah. I wish we had a few more stream mentors among the human rulers as well. Wouldn't that be good to have a few more stream mentors among human rulers? But even in Buddhist countries, they don't have stream mentors as the rulers. You go to Thailand or you go to Sri Lanka, even there you don't find the, the kind of the, the, the rulers are usually not the best people. Yeah? The rulers are a bit dodgy. Yeah? The best people are somewhere off in the jungle meditating for themselves. That's where you find the best ones. <laughs> But the, uh, the Sakapanya Sutta is beautiful, uh, very, very nice sutta. And uh, one of the places I was just mentioning about Rajaga, I just mentioned to Venerable Punsuri just before, is the uh, uh, Indasala Guha, yeah? the, the cave where this sutta is supposed to have taken place. Yeah? The sutta where the Buddha speaks to Saka, that's found in Rajaga. And you can go there, and uh, this time it would be the when we go there this year, this will be the first time we go to the Indasala Gua. I've never been there before. That will be exciting. So those of you who come with me, we'll, can, we'll go there. And maybe we'll read the Sakapanya Sutta when we go to the Indasala Cave. <laughs> that will be fascinating and see what happens. It's a beautiful sutta and very inspiring. But it takes a long time. So we're going to have to have take the old kind of long field trip to the Indasala Gua. So the Buddha is teacher of gods and humans. So Saka even though Saka is an incredibly splendid person or splendid God, yeah, when you see Saka, it's like, wow. And in the Sutta, it starts off by saying all of these other kind of spiritual teachers in ancient India, when Saka went to them and asked the same questions, uh, they all became Saka's disciples. Uh, yeah? Saka tries to ask them for questions, uh, but actually they don't want to... He doesn't even get the chance because straight away they kind of prostrate themselves on the ground and say, we are your disciples because Saka is so splendid, right? You see what I'm trying to say? So it's like no, so it's very hard. You know, when you see something like that, like a God, which is so splendid, you tend to want to pray to this God instead of actually answering the questions. But sometimes just because something is splendid doesn't mean that there is much wisdom necessarily. And so the gods become the disciples of the Buddha instead. Teachers of gods and humans. It's kind of nice. Yeah. And so the highest wisdom in the world is found among humanity, not among the gods. The gods are a bit, uh, you know, they are nice people or nice beings, uh, but they don't always understand. They are a bit deluded. Uh, don't tell your Christian friends. Uh. <laughs> and, uh, so this is how it goes. A teacher of gods and humans. Uh. I'm a very naughty monk, so I apologize. Uh. And then at the very end, uh, he is awakened and blessed. Yeah, uh, Buddho Bhagava. Bhagava is like uh, a lord. Bhagava is used in India for anyone who is kind of uh, a god or fully enlightened or something like that. They're called Bhagava. And some of those Bhagavas in India, they're really dodgy uh, because they just take the name Bhagava because they want to kind of gain some power. So don't trust all the Bhagava just because someone is called Bhagava. But in this case, it is uh, duly... Uh, duly used, as they say. So, um, I will stop there, and then we will carry on uh, uh, after lunch. Let's do a little bit of meditation and see if there are some final questions before we break for lunch. Okay, 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 okay. So, uh, any... Uh, Comments or questions uh, before lunch? <laughs> mm -hmm.
Asuki Hall to uh, Ajahn. Yes. I just want to go back to Angulimala. Angulimala. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, yeah. the impression I get uh, was that if you get, if you have done something really bad, yeah. if you just say forget it or put it past because the past is history yeah. and you move on, it gives the impression that Angulimala got it very, uh, very nicely because he became an arahant. Yeah. But I thought there was some more than that, that he actually had to go through great suffering because the people were very angry with him. Yeah. And he was only after the baby, yeah. I think he helped deliver the baby. And I thought yeah. uh, we, we, maybe you could expand on that. Yeah. Yeah. So that, there's, there's many things with the Angulimala story. That is, that is a very interesting, actually, interesting story. Uh, one of the things is that the number of people that he killed is very uncertain. Uh, it's it, because there are many different versions of that uh, sutta, and in some versions they killed a thousand people, another version they killed a hundred, another version they killed ten. You know, so so basically inflation has been happening, dung dung, more and more because it sounds more impressive, right? When you have more people on there, but it, it obviously killed at least probably a few even, right? Uh, so obviously it was that, yeah, yeah. So that that is the important point. But still, if you keep, there may be a difference though between a thousand and, and and two people, you know, so uh, so. Anyway, just as part of it, you always have to remember that some of these, and, and the Angulimala Sutta is a narrative, and because it is a narrative, those suttas are often more inflationary than other suttas. Uh, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that, uh, yes, he, he obviously had to experience some of the uh, retribution or the, or the comic retribution afterwards, so it's still not a good idea. It's not that we recommend killing. You know? Killing will definitely have some repercussions for you, so it's not a good idea. Uh, so uh, that absolutely seems to be the case. Uh, but the point is, for me, the point about that story is that uh, we should never think that we have done some bad karma that is kind of irredeemable and that we are lost and we, kind of, we are so bad we cannot get our meditation together. That is never really the case, uh, unless you killed your parents or something like that. Uh, but most people haven't killed their parents. It's quite rare for that to happen. And so for all of us, the, 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 really the answer is, to okay, this is the past, as you say, to learn to forgive yourself, uh, to understand the ideas of causality. We do things, even in Angulimala's case, it did things because of cause and conditions. Yeah, there were reasons why I did that. And I think maybe once he started to get insight into those reasons, uh, to seeing how he was almost forced to do it uh, because of uh, whatever conditions where he was able to forgive himself. And that forgiveness... Is that what allows you to um, uh, to um, uh, let go of the past and basically carry on and become enlightened? And that's what we should all do with ourselves. We should all forgive ourselves, understand that we are largely trapped in that by our conditioning. Our conditioning forces us to do things in a certain way. It feels like we are free to make choices, but that very feeling of freedom is part of the delusion of a self. Yeah, that is where the issue arises. And so we, uh, so that is kind of, I think that is the, for me the most important lesson there. Never think you are hopeless. Never think that you are kind of, you can't do this. Yes, you can. And what you really have to do is just to let go of the past, carry on, do your very best now, be committed and persevere, and then the results can happen to anyone. Is that what you wanted to ask or did you want to do it? So, so then, so to karma, because you still have to pay back yeah. for the action, sure. whether yeah. you kill one or you kill a thousand. I think that doesn't really matter to me, but the fact that he killed, he gets yeah, it is linked to karma, but karma, so, but so, yeah, but I think the point of the karma doesn't necessarily block you from enlightenment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is there such a Buddhist concept of uh, like repentance? Like in Christianity, there is a word repentance? Um, I don't know whether in Buddhism yeah, because repentance has a kind of a slightly negative feeling. Yeah, yeah, it has a feeling of uh, kind of being feeling guilty and this kind of stuff. And uh, it's not the in in Buddhism we talk about forgiveness instead. Uh, that is a much more powerful idea because you can let go completely of things. Repentance usually implies negative feelings. That's not the way I understand the word repentance. Uh, so uh, yeah, so we try to avoid those negative feelings in Buddhism. Uh, bypass that tick. Yeah. Yeah. Ajahn, uh, related to her question, actually, I also have uh, yesterday you mentioned, was it yesterday? You mentioned that um, sometimes when your meditation don't work, it's because your ethics is not ethical conduct is not pure enough. 
you know, so now I am uh, reflecting back on this. When then yeah. on the other hand, you say that you know we cannot expect to be perfect, and yeah. we have people asking questions about how we should be more responsible. You know, I mean, people could hear it wrongly. Yeah. So is it that when we meditate more, more of the right attitude, like I mean, Sadhguru Janya calls it right attitude, like how we respond to any defilements that arise, you know, because those are resultants or. How would you reconcile these when well, you say yeah, so the, the, ethical conduct is not pure? So uh, the um, you know, I mean, someone like Angulimala, he may have been a very nice person in his many ways, but he had this maybe one thing. I mean, it is said that he killed people because his teacher demanded him to do it. So it may have been maybe apart from that, he was a really nice person, uh, and so one, in one area he was kind of deluded, yeah. And so that means that maybe he, once he understood that, his kind of whole character became wholesome as a consequence. Uh, and so the ethics are actually very, very, very important. It's really important that we do the right thing here, because generally speaking, you will feel better about yourself. Uh, but if we make a mistake, and everybody will make mistakes, uh, if we make a mistake, then we, 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 for, we try to forgive ourselves for making those mistakes, because we realize it is human to make mistakes. We're not... It's impossible to avoid making mistakes altogether. That's just not the way the path works. So, so it is this combination of the two things. On the one hand, you do your very best to live a really ethical life. On the one hand, on the other hand, you understand that you will make mistakes and you forgive yourself on the other hand. But if you think that you can make mistakes just as much as you want and then forgive yourself, then it won't work because you're not even trying. And then the, it, you will actually, the, that, that will inhibit that forgiveness from happening because you don't really care. So this is kind of the combination of the two. You do your very best, and then you understand, okay, I will not be upset for myself for making mistakes. Instead, I will forgive because I understand how I'm trapped by cause and conditions. Then you get the two things together. Is that what you were asking? Sort of? Not quite. Okay, try again. I think yeah. more specifically about meditation, like what you mean by when you say yesterday, if you can't, you meditate and you don't get all the jhanas, and yeah. because your conduct is not pure enough, I yeah. you say something else. Yeah. So this, yeah. So this is so. This, so this is what we do. Then we, you, you try to, you know, you look at your conduct, and then you understand. I mean, that can be helpful because if you understand that your conduct is blocking your meditation, if you can see that, then that would be another motivation to improve your conduct. Yeah. So then you become even more careful about your conduct. Yeah? But the point is to, the point is to. Um, understand the power of good conduct, the power of Sila, the more you understand that, the more motivation you will have to live really, really well, uh, to the point where you actually start to be compassionate and kind to everyone at all times, also mentally, right? Uh, so the idea here is just to understand the power of virtue, uh, and uh, that's kind of what it really comes down to. And if you still make a mistake, yeah, then you forgive yourself. Uh, but virtue is the foundation for everything on the Buddhist path. Uh, so always, if you can, always have compassion and kindness for Everyone, even the most uh, dodgy characters, uh, yeah, and you're on track, yeah, yeah. So, Ajahn, yeah. I think the uh, this is universal because very hard for us to wrap our head around is the idea that we have to feel guilty about something, that we always have to punish ourselves because. Yeah. And uh, talking about the Christians, uh, they yeah. do reinforce that that, do. that you're doomed. You know, you kind of. You kind of, and then you're going to ask somebody to forgive you for, for that. And yeah. then they reinforce it further by saying, actually, that's not enough. You need to believe it wholeheartedly. So, that, so the guilt becomes more and more reinforced. Uh, of course, the question is then, uh, we do have the, the phrase in, in the Pali, you know, where we chant uh, the, the asking for forgiveness. Yeah. And, and, and how is that going to be helpful? Is that asking for forgiveness help, yeah. helpful in a sense? Uh, or do uh, sometimes do we have to do something to sort of in like a repentance uh, approach where yeah, you have yeah, to do yeah. something to to repay and and that, that that seems to be very very strongly rooted in our yeah. in our culture and also in our life. Yeah, yeah I think uh, let, let's let's kind of not take things from Christianity because uh, Christianity sometimes, in my opinion, it's you know Buddhism is different uh, and we follow the Buddhist ideas. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's it never, and this is one of the kind of points of getting some insight into your conduct and understand that you are conditioned. Uh, once you understand that, you won't feel guilty anymore because you realize it doesn't really have anything to do with you. Uh, and you kind of avoid all of this repentance and all of these kind of negative emotions that are use, entirely useless. Uh, the only 
emotion that we talk about in Buddhism, we talk sometimes about the idea of shame, yeah, uh, or feeling it kind of, you know, hiri otapa. We talk about those two. Hiri is a sense of shame, and otapa is the fear of the consequences of your actions. Uh, now, that is a natural sense that sometimes you have. You know, if you have done something bad, you may feel slightly ashamed about what you have done. And that is kind of okay, because it helps you to guide you in the right direction. But guilt is more than that. Uh, guilt is kind of a sense that you need to be punished or something like that for what you have done. Uh, so try by trying to understand uh, uh, that we are conditioned beings, the more you see that in yourself, uh, the more ability you will have to let go and ha to have compassion for yourself. Uh, the problem is that we have a sense of self, and the sense of self is the one that destroys everything, because the sense of self is the part that tells you that you have to be punished. Uh, yeah, the sense of self is really the biggest problem here. Uh, and this is why the stream enter it, because uh, they have seen through the sense of self. Uh, that's why they can never get reborn in the lower realm, because they know that they are conditioned this way. They will be able to forgive anything they have done. Uh, that's kind of the point. Uh, so we take a leaf out of the book of the stream enters uh, and say they don't judge themselves harshly because they know they're conditioned. I also shouldn't judge myself harshly. Okay, I made a mistake. Why did I make that mistake? If you, the moment you judge yourself very harshly and you feel guilty, at that moment you lose your ability to contemplate uh, because that self-judgment is a harshness about yourself. Uh, and at that moment you, have a, you are kind of distorting, you have a bias in your mind. Uh, but if you kind of say calmly, okay, I made a mistake. Why did that happen? Uh, okay, for this reason. Then you can change your attitude. Then you can improve. Uh, not through being harsh, but actually through just being calm and wise about what is going on, and then your attitude can, can become different. And then gradually you turn the super tanker around. And one day you have mostly compassion and kindness for everyone because you realize everyone is trapped in this life. Everyone has all these terrible habits from the past that we carry with us. And you, you, you know, how can you not have compassion for everyone? And this is you know, especially, maybe especially the perpetrators because the perpetrators of crime, they will suffer so enormously in the future. The victims, we suffer here and now, but the victims don't have a great future suffering, but the perpetrators are destroying their own lives. Yeah, of course, you, when you look at it rightly, they too, you know, are worthy of compassion in that way. Maybe you can't help them, but you can always have compassion. But I think it's time for lunch. <laughs> Thank you. Let's have lunch, everyone. <laughs>